When I first started going to the seas, there weren't any Native people that I could tell. Um, there may have been Native people attending the convention, and in retrospect, I know that someone like Jill Hodges was probably there, but not marked in a way that I could find her. Her presentation didn't tell me to find her. So I remember really clearly in um, 1994, um, Scott Lyons did a presentation on um, the Indian-only composition classes at the University of North Dakota. And I saw that, you know, I saw um, him in the program and immediately, like, I went to his session because I thought, well, even if he isn't an Indian, he knows Indians. <laughs> um, and so, of course, it turned out that his presentation was very much the kind of stuff that I had been thinking about. And um, we, you know, exchanged information and got to know each other and I eventually recruited him to come to Miami of Ohio where I was doing doctoral work. Um, and a couple years, I guess it was, that was the year that I was named Scholar for the Dream in 94. And um, two years later, Janice Gould got named Scholar for the Dream. And um, by then, there, there was a very small group of Native people going to the seas, and we all knew each other. Scott, me, uh, Joyce Anderson, um, Risa Bizarro started showing up. Amanda Cobb appeared. Um, and we, we had these sort of like informal meetings with each other um, that weren't really caucus meetings, but that were caucus-like. Many of us still belong to the um, Latina caucus. And then um, one year, and I actually, I tried to think about this this morning. I think it was 1997, because uh, Scott and I were roommates, and that was my last year of, at, at Miami. Um, we just decided to go ahead and propose a real caucus session. And we did, and we got on the program, and Sandra Gibbs saw us on the program and said, I'm gonna make you an NCTE caucus, you guys need to be an NCTE caucus. Um, but it was like a very informal and slow process of finding Native people based on what the titles for their presentations were, um, and just trying to figure out you know, who, was, who were gonna be allies and who were gonna be um, just not allies. How's that, not allies? We named the caucus the Caucus for American Indian Scholars and Scholarship. And the goal was to get people together who were doing um, work in RETCOMP around um, Native Studies stuff and to have discussions about, you know, things like what kind of methodologies were going to be acceptable, what kind of theoretical work were people doing. So part of it was sheer support and part of it was a kind of, um, a kind of quality control moment where we could really you know, think about how we wanted to talk about folks who were doing work that seemed um, too stereotypical, too um, offensive. Um, <laughs> you know, what I would call two beads and feathers, like too many beads and feathers, right, in this paper. People need to like cut out the flute music and do the actual work. Um, and, and, and so the title was important for us because you know, in Native Studies there are all sorts of arguments about authenticity and identity. And we wanted, um, we wanted for people doing work in the area, whether they were or weren't Native, to, be, to feel welcome at the, at the caucus. And that made us a little different than, a, than at least the, one of the other big caucuses. Um, I would say the Black Caucus has always been very specific about their membership. Um, and the Latino Caucus has always been more open about their membership. They encouraged all of us to join, um, even like folk, Therese Malmberg, folks that would have belonged to an Asian American caucus if there were one. We all belonged to the Latina caucus and it was very open and welcoming. Um, and so we wanted to have an open and welcoming space as well, especially because non-natives doing research are sort of at risk of not having access to the sort of appropriate methodologies. Um, and that, that's worked really well for us. Even after um, Sandra changed our name when we became an NCTE caucus, mostly to make it parallel with the other caucus names, um, we've always been able to sort of draw p everybody who's doing work in the area instead of just drawing Native people. Now that makes the caucus a different kind of space. Um, it's not so much that you can kind of always just divulge all the awful things that are happening to you or the things that you might need help with um, in, a, in a kind of confessional way. Um, but it has added the advantage of young scholars as they come into the field and want to do work in Native Studies, know that they can come to the caucus and get advice and support. And in truth, like those folks are just as important to us. There aren't so many of us that we can afford to say, well, we don't want these people and we want these people. Um, we want everybody doing work on American Indians to, um, 
to have access to good methodologies, to actual native scholars in the field. I think that the hardest part of the caucus is that balance between providing support for people doing work um, and not encouraging people who come and ask questions that seem really uncomfortable. Um, at the last caucus meeting, there was a woman there who asked us how many of us spoke our language. And, um, and people just sort of didn't answer her. Um, and I don't know if she'll come back or not, but, um, but that sort of like sense of people coming and asking really inappropriate questions, like they think that, oh, they'll come to the caucus meeting and then they can ask these research questions about native culture that they have that really come out of that anthropological mindset um, with the idea that Indians are vanishing and we've given up our traditional cultures and all that kind of stuff. So we've always had those moments, not every year, but enough like every other year, every two or three years. There have been a lot of cross-caucus uh, collaborations, um, some of them official and some of them sort of unofficial. Um, I mean, the biggest one is that, um, you know, when the Asian American, when, when Morris Young and Lu Ming Mao wanted to start the Asian American Caucus, they came to us to ask us how we did it because we were the people who had done it in the most recent memory. Um, and I think at least twice um, the Latina Caucus and the Native Caucus have gotten together to do a workshop for faculty women um, that, um, that would be like a big Wednesday workshop where we brought in um, people. We, one year we did a, a mentoring workshop and brought in um, our mentors in, in our fields, right? So Chicana Studies mentors and Native Studies mentors. And that was a lovely workshop. I mean, people talked really honestly about their work um, we've had a lot of collaboration, I think, between the women in the caucuses um, in relation to things like the Committee on the Status of Women, right? When the, the years that they decide to look at women of color, um, you know, there's always some collaborative work in an kind of behind the scenes way from the women of color who are going to be there about what we're going to talk about. And um, so I think that there has been those official ones and then the unofficial ones where we just like stop meeting early so that we can go talk to each other. Um, or, you know, we'll, our, there'll be four people at our meeting that year, and so we'll just suspend it and then go over to the Latina Caucus instead. Um, I think in recent years that has seemed more disruptive to people in, in the Latino Caucus um, because there are more men in it. <laughs> so now I'm going to be the one that hates men, but I don't hate men, actually, <laughs> not at all. Um, I, I just think that the kind of communities that women of color make with one another are really different than the kind of communities that we make when we're in mixed gender groups. And I think that especially, um, at least in the four C's and in my other experience in, in Native studies, and, you know, as a literature person as well, um, Native women and Latina women have a lot, we have a lot in common. And we have a lot of similarities in how we talk to each other. And I think that that's been a real place of support for a lot of folks who go to the seas. Um, we go to each other's sessions and we support each other. I think that having an interest in literature as a rhetoric person is one of the commonalities you're going to find among what, what they call the ethnic caucuses, right? So the Asian American caucus, the black caucus, the native caucus, the Latina, Latino caucus. Um, now I have to include the men, right? Because I've said something that might be determined, you know, bad. Um, <laughs> and I think that's something we share. A lot of, a lot of folks, a lot of folks of color enter um, sort of publicness through um, literature, through our literatures. And um, at least in a lot of the undergraduate programs, that's the place where you're going to find the folks whose life experiences are more like you. Um, and so it's not unusual for us to be um, literature scholars, publishing poets or essayists or fiction writers, um, rhetoric scholars, all at once. Um, so I think for us it's not attention so much as a commonality, something that, you know, it, it's just not appropriate if you're doing Asian American rhetoric not to know what's going on in Asian American literature. Doesn't mean you're in that field, but you have to know what's going on in it. Um, for me, Native Studies is, is always a bridge out to other things um, and to other disciplines. And it's been an extremely instructive bridge. I think that folks who shut themselves up inside that single discipline and never try to bridge 
don't get that kind of instruction about the flexibility of theory, about the importance of the human experience in our work, about um, the kind of uh, cat-like reflexes you have to have if you're going to teach undergraduates. Um, <laughs> You know, there's, there's that sort of like body of knowledge you can draw on. Um, so for me, it makes a deeper well. Um, and I know that it's, you know, I mean, I, when I came into Comp Ret, when I decided on composition studies, the big debate over literature in the composition classroom was raging. And, um, and that was the basis of my entire application to graduate school, was that I was going to bring multicultural literature into the composition classroom. And um, I understand the terms under which that argument took place as terms that have to do with disciplinarity and staking out territory and um, you know, rationalizing a discipline outside of literary studies, um, but I, I just I don't agree with it. I think it's um, a narrowing we don't have to have and it, you know, having, being in a program where students don't have any instruction in literature at all or literary studies. Um, I have to say, it's hard for me sometimes if I'm working with a student who wants to do post-colonial rhetorics and we're talking about theory and I say, well, you know, in Jane Eyre, and he's like, I've never read Jane Eyre. And I say, what literature have you read? And there's nothing. And I'm like, wow, that isn't really what we wanted, is it? 